the, the early idolaters were not unaware of God, God the creator of the universe. They knew this. There was never a time when people didn't know that there was a creator. The problem with early year uh, idolaters is that they, they made a mistake concerning God's investment in his creation. So even the early idolaters did not believe that the sun created the world or the moon created the world. On the contrary, they were fully aware that the sun itself was created and the moon was created and uh, all the uh, gods that they worshipped were all created. They knew this. It wasn't even a matter of belief. But what they did believe is that God is very busy. He's got many things to do. And after creating our universe, he went off to do other things and left our universe under the control of his ministers, the sun, the moon, gravity, whatever. And they therefore felt that when they have a need, there's no point in turning to God who is now preoccupied with other things. If you need something and you want your need provided, talk to the powers that control it. So if you need uh, your, your crop to, to grow and, and be healthy, then you pray to the sun. If you need a little romance in your life, then you pray to the moon. <laughs> you go to the source of things. Their mistake, of course, is that they attributed some amount of independence and free will to the sun and to the moon. It's true, the sun makes things grow. But it's not true that the sun can decide one day that he's not going to do it. So the sun makes things grow, but not, not by choice, not voluntarily. So the Gemara has an interesting example for it. When you're sitting in a restaurant and the waiter brings you wine, you thank him, knowing that the wine is not his. It's not that he's giving you his wine. And yet you thank him because he delivered the wine. He served it. But if it's not his wine, what are you thanking him for? Why does he deserve thanks? He deserves thanks because he had the option not to bring it to the table. So since he is a willing server, you thank him for his willingness. But that's a human being. If somebody trained a cat to serve the food, you would not thank the cat. Because trained as it is, it has no, has no freedom of choice. Same is true with parents. Parents give birth to a child. Of course, God provides the soul and God provides the health and God provides the miracle of birth. So why are you thanking your parents? Why do you owe them gratitude? Because they could have decided they don't want to bring children into the world. So for their willingness, they deserve credit. So that was the mistake of the idolaters. They believed that the sun, the moon, the fertility god, the uh, thunder god, whatever, had some free choice. And if they get into a bad mood, they won't provide the service that they're supposed to provide. And that's a terrible mistake. So, 
knowing that God is the creator of all, uh, which has always been known, even in the times of the idolaters, we gain something very, very precious. That God is personally involved in the birth of a child. It's not the stork. It's not the laws of nature. It's not the fertility God. It's God himself. Isn't that what gives life its sanctity? What makes life sacred? Where did we get this respect for life? In fact, where did we get this grief that comes from death? Imagine that we didn't think life was sacred and that we didn't grieve when people died. What kind of a world would we have? Just from that alone. What a change that brought to the world. Why is human sacrifice forbidden? Why did God go through that whole spiel with Avraham? Sacrifice your son. No, don't sacrifice your son. What was that all about? At that time in the world, and the world was pretty sophisticated by then, sacrificing your child seemed like a perfectly normal and virtuous thing to do. That's how bad the world would be without Judaism. Judaism introduced the sanctity of life. Judaism says that life is precious to God. That's what it tells us. God created Adam and said it is very good. And when Cain killed Abel, God was very upset. You see, there was no commandment that said life is sacred. God modeled the sanctity of life from his perspective. He finds life sacred. Now, when we try to imitate God, which is what Judaism is all about, um, the first thing we imitate is the sanctity of life. In other words, God says to me, for some mysterious divine reasons, life on earth is sacred. Now, you try to have that same attitude and cultivate that same feeling in yourself so that you'll see what I see. You'll be more like me. So where does the sanctity of life come from? From God, because he sees it first, and then we try to imitate it. And how do we know anything about God's view of life? From the, from the Torah. It tells us something really fundamental. It's not like we find our life precious and God keeps killing people as if we are disposable. And so we have to fight with God, beg God, convince God that he shouldn't be so frivolous with our lives because our lives are precious. Our lives matter. That is a very depressing, morbid picture of, of reality. My life matters to me. I got to convince God that it should matter to him. So maybe if I behave myself, maybe if I pray to him a lot, maybe if I sacrifice my firstborn, maybe he'll take me seriously. 
That is a very, very disturbing picture. It can't possibly be true. We have the opposite picture. Your life matters to God. Now try to make it matter to you too. Because if it matters to him, there must be something precious there. See if you can find what is precious about your life and about everybody's life, about life itself. That, besides being a more Jewish concept, it's a much healthier concept. Intuitively, it feels better, it feels right. We don't have to convince the creator who created life that my life matters. And if I do have to convince him, I'm in big trouble. The whole, the whole thing is upside down, it's, it, it makes no sense. And yet, in many ways, that's what religion seems to be saying. God doesn't find you important. You don't matter to him. Unless you do something to get his attention. That's disturbing and disturbed. So let's, let's examine for a moment. What does it mean life matters? What does that mean? Matters for what? For whom? To whom? And if you have to convince people that life matters, what are people thinking? If this is a discussion, if this is a debate, if this is something that needs to be resolved, we're in bad shape. So we used to speak about the sanctity of life. Now we're saying life matters. What does that mean? What does it mean? Life matters to whom? Life matters for what? Why does life matter? Any life. Sacred means it's out of reach. You can't go there. That's what it means. So life is beyond you. Even your own life is beyond you. You can't go there. You can't make decisions about life, not even your life, which is why suicide is forbidden. It's not your life to end just like it wasn't your life to begin. So life is sacred means you have no say. It's way beyond you. You're out of your league. You're out of your debt. God created us with a mind of our own, with a will of our own, and with the freedom to choose to, to respond to him or not to respond to him, to obey him or disobey him. God also gave us independence in the sense of ownership. Every person is the owner of his own property. So the commandment thou shalt not steal is basically saying people own what they have. It's yours. When God asks you to give charity, He's asking you to give what is yours. That's another contribution from Judaism. That even God will not take away your property without justification. Because he made it yours. You have ownership. In many ways, God will defend your ownership by making stealing a sin. And all, all sorts of stealing, cheating, kidnapping, 
you can't you can't do this because there is such a thing as ownership. One thing that God never allows us to own is life. God gives us life, but he never gave us ownership. You are not in possession of your life. You live it, you experience it, you enjoy it, you suffer from it. It is never yours. I don't know if you can say it's on loan from God and you got to give it back in good shape. That's what we call sacred. Sacred means you cannot own it. It's not like property, which God really makes yours. But with life, when he gives life, he never lets go. You talk about a gift with strings attached. <laughs> These are not strings. These are cords, chains. He gives you life and never lets go, never takes his hand off. So it remains his. Maybe that's what we mean, that there are three partners in the birth of a child. The father and the mother contribute the human stuff, the body stuff. God contributes the soul. But he never lets go of the soul. So he's like, puts a soul into the body, but never takes his hand off that soul. Never releases it from his grasp. That's what makes it sacred. So what is sacred in this world? God's name. Don't take God's name in vain. Uh, life. God never gave that away. Um, and intimacy. The ability to procreate. The ability to create a masterpiece, God gave away. It's as if God says, I can create masterpieces, and I'm giving you the ability to create masterpieces. If you're a great artist, a great writer, a great architect, you can create masterpieces. But I will not allow you to create life without me. Because procreation cannot be owned he never lets it out of his grasp. And that's why there are so many laws about intimacy and modesty and marriage. So if we take a look at the commandments, we won't go through all, through all ten. Thou shalt not murder. What does that say? That says that God never relinquished life into our choice, into our preference. We cannot kill when we're in the mood or when we're convinced that we should. Can't. Why? God never let go of life. Don't steal. What does that tell us? God gave property away to people. People really are the owners of their property, and even a government may not, under normal circumstances, walk away with your property. The strong may not rob the poor. So what does the commandment tell us? That property is not sacred. God lets it go. It becomes yours. To some degree, even God justifies asking you to give away your money. Or when he confiscates your money, he has to justify it. 
by his own by his own laws by his own standards. Then God says, "Don't commit adultery." What does that tell you? That tells you that God never relinquished intimacy. That's not something you can own. So if you do it the way he instructs through marriage and, and uh, sensitivity and intimacy and monogamy, then you, then you can experience this thing, this, this divine thing called intimacy or procreation. But if not, then you have no right to it. God never gave it away for you to rearrange, to reconstruct, to, uh, to take liberties with. So do, do lives matter? Do lives matter? There are 7 billion people in the world. A few billion Why would it matter? If we're going to be purely analytical about it. In fact, what would be the tragedy if there is only one billion? That's not enough. A billion people on planet Earth? It'd be very nice, manageable. Why does life matter? There are actually people who believe very deeply that human beings mess up nature. Nature is perfect until the human being comes along and, and destroys everything in his path. So nature or the, the universe, earth, would be better off without human beings. They really believe that. Lives matter. Animal lives matter. Vegetable life matters, not human lives. We are the lowest form of life. Mess up everything. So we're talking some pretty fundamental stuff here. What does the Torah say about life? The Torah says that without the human being, there would be no justification for nature, for creation, for planet Earth, for, pla for vegetable, for animal life, for, not, for anything. There would be no need and no justification for any of it, and it would not have been created. It was created only for the human being. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.